Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Conan. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've been a penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to this Monday edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. Spencer Israel, Dennis Dick, Mitch Hotch, Joel Alconin is on vacation. He deserves it. He needed it. So no Joel for the week. Maybe if we're lucky, we will get we will be privy to a phone call. We'll be able to talk to Joel by phone at some point this week, but I doubt it. I'm not putting my hopes up, getting my hopes up for that. But the show must go on. Uh, hope you all had a great weekend. We got a good one for you today. A lot of headlines over the weekend. There was a an M and A deal reported by, uh, by Bloomberg regarding Microsoft. We have Alibaba settling. It looks like finally with Chinese regulators. So that appears to be in the past for them. We've got some earnings this week. We got Uber out with a strong march, and uh, we'll take questions from our chat. Our guest today, two guests actually on this Monday show: Tim Quast, founder and CEO of Market Structure Edge. Will join us as he does every Monday at, at 8.35. And then at 9, I've got Matt Hammond from IPO Warriors. He's going to preview the IPO slate for the week. It is a big week, perhaps the biggest week of the year for IPOs. Why? Because of one IPO in particular, Coinbase. Coinbase is this Wednesday. We're going to talk about that with Matt Hammond at 9 o'clock. Today's show is also sponsored by Market Structure Edge. The link is up on the screen right there marketstructureedge.com the first decision support platform for traders built on market structure there is a link check it out there let me bring up my charts for some reason my charts aren't they're being really janky right now let me see if i can get my spy up there's my spy okay as you can see here in the spy i mean we're down overnight but not by much we're pre- we're still up from from where we were on friday so just about flat in the overnight session same story we're down a little bit more in the nasdaq uh pretty much flat in the russell bitcoin up three percent i don't even care about gold and gold and oil and silver guys i really don't so uh let's talk about bitcoin let's talk about ethereum ethereum that's what joel wants to talk about so that's what we're gonna talk about in his absence ethereum uh flat overnight uh spent the weekend pretty much going up at least on friday so uh we're up from friday in ethereum but flat in the overnight session there uh so up in bitcoin down a smidge in the overnight markets dennis how was your morning going how was your weekend first of all this was a moving weekend and it oh, no. was chaotic i'm in the new place the, the temporary place while the bulldozer is ready to knock over my old home to build the new home not looking forward to paying nine dollars two by four or fifty dollars or sixty dollars for a sheet of plywood. So I got to trade harder, I guess, to afford these COVID inflated prices. Oh no! Oh yeah. wait, wait, inflation. Inflation What's doesn't exist. What's that? Yeah, there's no, no, no such no, no, but... thing. I saw. I saw them this morning again. They were talking. There's been no inflation since the '80s. We don't have an inflation. No, so like, I, don't know what, uh, I don't know why you're talking about. That's not possible that a two by four, a three dollar two by four, is now nine dollars a year later. Not possible. There's no inflation. No, well, we're, we're waiting to see it get above 2%, though, Dennis. We're waiting. Yeah, we'll get there eventually to that <laughs> 2% threshold. If the TVs ever start going up, we're in real trouble. I'll tell you that much. So well, well, they're going to. There's going to be a meeting at the White House this week because everyone's afraid about the semiconductor shortage. Mm, so TVs are going to point. Up. So TVs are going to go up, too. And then we're in trouble. Then we're going to see inflation just start ramp up when those TVs start going up in price. So Maybe. Maybe. All right, you want to talk Baba? I know you do. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Settlement. Yeah, settlement. Like that. Yeah, Alibaba got hit with a uh, what comes out to be a record fine for China. It's a two point eight seven billion dollar antitrust fine uh, by Chinese regulators, which is the largest fine ever levied against a company in China. Uh, what is equivalent to about four percent of their total domestic annual sales. Um, number notwithstanding, though, the big thing with this company was the unknown. That unknown is now out of the way. Yeah. yeah. And therefore, it's a party. 
Yeah, as soon as I saw that, I wish that would have happened Friday night so I could have traded the action, but it happened after the 8 o'clock close. And as soon as I saw that, I was like, oh, it's going to pop on that news. So wish I could have traded it, but no, you get the gap up open here for Alibaba because um, this is the known. Just like you said, this was, a, this was a big unknown. It was a worry for myself even as a shareholder. It was a reason that I had sold shares originally right around this price. I'd be a buyer of pullbacks if we think we're in the clear here now because you know what? Alibaba is still cheap. I, I don't like chasing stocks up 13, but man, um, I don't think you're getting much of a pullback here. So you get down to the two low 230s, maybe you get a bad you know market for a day or two if that ever exists. Uh, but pullbacks, I think, are to be bought now in Alibaba because it looks like we're past the unknown. Very interesting trade this morning, though. Baba's up, but look around the rest of China, right? Baidu. Trading, Killed. trading down. JD, yeah. trading down. FXI, you want to go broad? FXI, trading down. So, is there a headline or is that just the let's sell everything else and buy Alibaba trade this morning? Yeah. Best and I can see they're, they're really, um, uh, I, I guess the, the head, here's what happened the head of the Chinese Center for Disease Control said that uh, vaccines have a low rate of efficacy. So, Maybe maybe it's that. Hitting stocks on um, stocks. But but um, yeah. I mean, there are some headlines on Friday between the White House and China. Nothing really, nothing too interesting. I thought, but interesting that Baba is flying in the. Interesting that Baba is not pulling the rest of China with it this morning. It's not. Yeah, you would think naturally if Baba's going to run six percent, that other Chinese stocks will be up in sympathy. But not the case. I mean, it is exclusive. This news is just to them. That right. has been sold. The stock is down, you know, we're down from $300 and you got to think about like, you know, the big cap momentum trade. A lot of, you know, them have come right back. Microsoft making new all time highs. Amazon has been breaking out and trying to get back up to its six month high. Apple's come back from the lows as well. So the mega cap trade is on. Bob, Bob is the big mega cap over in China. I think you buy it on the pullbacks if you get one. If you can get one, if you can get this at 230, I will try to probably rebuy the shares that I sold if I can get this around 230. Um, again, I don't like chasing up 13. It's just like page eight of my rule book. I just don't chase stocks, but I don't know, man. I almost want to chase in this case. So one maybe, of those. Maybe, maybe it's a question of, all right, they're done with Baba. Who's next? Right. But, uh, but I don't know how, how many more companies are, are big enough to, to get penalized for antitrust activities in China. I mean, Baba's the biggest, right? Baba and Tencent. So yeah. I, I, I don't They're know. looking at Tencent. Weren't they looking at Tencent? I thought yeah. I saw a headline yeah. or something that they were looking at Tencent. I, I, I think or so. did I dream that up? Was that a Joel Alconan dream? No. Where I confusing no. dreams with reality? Am I turning into Joel? <laughs> no, not help us. Speaking of Joel. Wait, speaking, speaking of, of Joel, should we go to the Joel's uh, pick? Joel's got a pick from us from the airplane, so he's nice yeah. enough to take a pick. Yeah, and we're going to show it right now. His 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 message to me was, "I'm not so sure about the reopening trade," and this is what he was showing. <laughs> that was a pick from his airplane going to Florida. Well, so, what airline? <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> but that's I was I looked at that and I was like, "Hmm, that's maybe Delta. I should dump all my reopening." Oh, the stock. Delta, the Delta stock. Oh, was it Delta? Yeah, you, you can tell by the seat. It's Delta. Oh, there you go, Spencer. You want to pay these kind of prices for these stuff, these companies? Delta is basically back to where it was prior to COVID. If you take obviously the dilution out of the equation, I mean, this is just you know like due diligence here. Joel's doing his due Paul's diligence. Doing his for research. Us. <laughs> this is his research. This is pretty good research. That picture scares the hell out of me. I would not buy Delta. Boots on, boots <laughs> on the ground, picture, Joel. Boots yeah. on the ground, channel checks from Joel O'Connor. Channel you're... checks are here, boots on the ground. And you know what? The channel checks are not showing well for DAL. I don't look, I even rhyme. All right, I'll tell you what. Uh I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna be flying in, in mid May. I'm gonna be flying Delta. So I'll I'll bring you another channel check in mid May when I fly. The the biggest issue is, you know, that you know, if Reddit gets a hold of that photo, they love companies <laughs> that or losing revenue and going out of business. Did you see the photo that I uh, tweet out on GameStop? Do you have that one? No, no. Wait, what? No. So, I... so we're doing. Oh, we're all doing our channel checks here. <laughs> I got my buddy in Chicago that sent me this picture of okay. GameStop. Get it, look at my Twitter account. Go to my tweet. Oh, I tweeted oh, oh, it out. Oh, closing. I see it. 
Thanks. Grab it. Grab this. So this is our channel checks. We were doing channel checks all weekend. We do research for you guys. Yeah, sure. This is coming from Indiana, actually. <laughs> this is straight from Indiana, this pick. Maybe Indiana's in tough shape, but no, if you great. zoom in there, you can clearly see GameStop. That's a closing sale. Yep, this location is closing down. That's bullish, though. So maybe this empty seats on Delta is <laughs> bullish, too. Maybe. <laughs> We know Reddit loves businesses that are closing down. They know what? They know what they're doing, man. Those Reddit traders are smart. They find value. So maybe they're gonna find the value in, in Delta as well. But I, I don't know. I don't uh -oh. know. Delta has earned. Look, I got somebody days. on just handing me my iPad. Thank you. <laughs> Thought oh, my kids oh. were the research, the research team. On the ground. Pre 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 boots on the ground here for you guys. Boots we are ground. all over it for well, you here. We'll have to get Joel's uh picture of some various chain of restaurants while he's down there to see how, they, how they're performing. Uh, like Famous Dave's, for example, which we talked about on Friday. I might add, if you're watching the stream Friday, I don't know, like 3 o'clock, you probably heard Mitch and I talk about BBQ. Famous Dave's is up again this morning. Wow. No clue why. Is this a Reddit stock? I don't that, even that know. shirt looks like a Reddit shirt. BBQ, man. Are People. they talking Reddit traders? I know it's for you in the chat. Are they talking BBQ on Reddit? I, yeah. I got to start looking at Reddit more. I I was looking at it nonstop there for a while when the game stopped, and now, now I've stopped. I'm going to come back over to you, Reddit, and give you guys some love there, Reddit. This is a Reddit stock? I it's six almost bucks. Doubled. I don't know. Six bucks. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven days ago, and now it's thirteen ninety. Now fourteen twenty one in the pre-market. That's yeah. a nice pop on BBQ. So this is Famous Dave's? Oh my god, like charts being weird. The famous Dave's. This man. is famous Dave's. Is that's what this barbecue it, stock is? Famous Dave's? Yeah, it's BBQ holding. So they own a few <laughs> restaurants. One of them is famous Dave's. I'm gonna tell you. I used to like going when before COVID, when we could actually go out to restaurants. I used to like going over because I can't cross the border. There's no famous Dave's in Canada, but I used to like cross that border to go to that famous Dave's. They had one dollar beers. How can you go wrong? Twelve ounce beer. Well, it depends. On, it depends on the beer, Dennis. It was PBR. You can't oh. go wrong with PBR. I was tweeting about that this week. You, you, you too. couldn't pay me to have that. Ugh. It's so you could wash down the pork. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, good. You could go over there for fifteen bucks, get stuffed off on pulled pork, and drink yourself a couple of PBRs, and you're laughing. I go ahead and like this barbecue trade. I'm not chasing it, but. I think I like Famous Dave's. What happened was Famous Dave's saw that I was smoking some good ribs over the weekend. Oh, and, yeah. And they, they started the catalyst, you know? You awesome. might have started the catalyst. They saw Mitch barbecuing. <laughs> Let's buy that barbecue stock. That Mitch, he makes good ribs. Here, yeah. I, here, you I know thought what? at first this was a barbecue like maker. At first, when I saw barbecue holdings, I was like, "Do they make barbecues?" <laughs> okay, so, ticker symbol. It so, should be worth money just because the ticker symbol. That's got to be worth money. You think about like URLs, what they're worth. Our StockTrading.com URLs worth some money. That barbecue ticker symbol should be worth some money. It's a good one, man. Wait, wait, wait. wait. You guys own Stock Trading URL? What? Stock bright trading, trading on stock oh. stocktrading.com right there oh, okay, okay. Boom. i thought you, don I thought... bright all over in like 1992 bought right. that for seven bucks Ooh. that's that that's that stock ticker is worth some money they bright trading's been offered some hey, bucks for that if you guys want to do what we can do a whole show on domain owning because luke and jason between them own a lot of domains i bought a bunch too always <laughs> <laughs> they always <laughs> i always go and i like that's a good name i was like scooping up nft domains like in the last <laughs> week not joking, like just grabbing random NFT things I could think of. They're like, it's like low hanging fruit. It's like, you know, you're just penny options. I was like, oh, I can buy that one for three bucks. And then they give you the two for one deal. I was like, ah, oh, we'll think of another NFT one and another NFT one. Somebody rings the, you know, ring, rings my phone there. Want to buy that? Sure. Cash out. <laughs> or maybe I'm going to start, I might start an NFT business. I might just start selling like NFTs. Yeah. It'd be fun. Yeah. With, Wait. Go, uh, Mitch, go ahead. With barbecue, we got to remember the couple stocks that were moving with it. Um, yeah. Yeah. On that day, we also saw love getting some love. Yeah. Love sad. And then, um, two that we mentioned to keep on the radar were home and OSTK. Uh, we, we discussed all these. You together. know what? You were given this. You gave us this OSTK back in January when it was around yep. 62 or 63, and it ran to 100. And you're giving us OSTK back here again. Same trade. Deja vu all over again. Mitch already gave us this one. 
That's that's I, exactly how I'm feeling too. I'm a fan of you know what I've been talking about the Kathy. This isn't a Kathy stock, but the high you know high PE stuff, no earnings or very low earnings, but high growth. I've been talking about these stocks last week, and I think there's some still some love that happened in there. Arc didn't have a great day on Friday. It's still kind of holding out there. I bought a few growth names. They're kind of holding on. They're not going up is the problem though too. And that's POI keeps going up, ripping into the close again. So. I don't know, man. I don't know if it's going to turn. Are we going to turn and start this growth trade all over again? Because that's all that matters on OSDK. It's going to be a matter of is the growth name start to get some love because they're all beaten down. I mean, you can look. There's probably 100 growth names that were widely followed, widely owned in a lot of different accounts that are beaten down like this. I think they're oversold. So I don't mind it. You, 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 it's hard to chase after Friday. up seven. You know, It's up eight, eight bucks from where it was just on you know Thursday morning. But a little pullbacks here, buying the dips, selling the rips, seems to continue to work. Uh, well, one more thing before we go away from the BBQ is I do want to pit note uh, like peers, like um, other restaurant, other barbecue uh, stocks, not barbecue stocks, but like oh. you know uh, small mid cap restaurants. Uh, so maybe like a BJ's restaurant. I saw someone mention BJRI in the chat. Maybe a Ruiz Chris. I don't know Taco, right? Well, let's look at all those. I, give, I don't, us, give us the symbols. I'm not saying they're moving. I'm saying if BBQ can do this, why not Bloom and I Bloom. like that. Yeah. Denny's. That's my name. That's yeah, got to be a good B-E-N-N, one. B-E-N-N. You got Bloom and Bloom. Outback Steakhouse. B-L-M-N. Right? Dinequity. D-I-N. These uh, guys all have awesome ticker symbols. We got to get some props out to the restaurants. They're good at the ticker symbols. We got Bloomin for the Bloomin' Onion, I'm assuming. Yeah. You've got D-I-N. Let's dine. Yep. Denny's. How do you go wrong? Denny's. If I was ever going to get a ticker symbol, it was going to be, I was going to take it from 3D systems. Or I was going to take it from Denny's. A D-E-N or D-Triple D. D-D-D. Yeah. I still want the Triple D one, but yeah, they still haven't went out of business. So you if they can, go out of business, I'm scooping the ticker. You symbol. can go loco, El Pollo Loco. Um, <laughs> Jason was bullish Del Taco for a long time. He, he said that he's out on Friday, but I, I actually had that stock with him. I bought it with Jason. We rode that up from like seven to ten. I I sold mine too. I already sell yeah. too early, but I think I got like forty or fifty percent. That was a Jason Rasnick pick. Thank you, Jason. Yeah. Take a look at some maybe some outdoor plays. Um, Yeti, Yeti's going to be an is interesting that starting one. to go again. I yep. it yes, it is. I tell so, you, the outdoor plays are not going away. We're getting warmer weather here. People are going to want to go camping, boating, all that what's stuff. What's the Winnebago one? Uh, I forgot. W- the w- WGO. W- that's pulled back, maybe. maybe. Maybe there's a play there, too. Maybe there's a play there, yeah. I like the outdoor plays. I'm a fan. I'm a fan of the outdoors. I'm a fan of boating. We need, like, a boating. Hey, is there a good boating stock? Soon. Yeah, What's I'm a good camping. boating stock? There is. There is. Oh, gotcha. I mean, you could grab... There's um because uh, there are pure boating play, yeah yeah though. yeah Malibu what's the ticker from Malibu it's uh uh Malibu M B U U yeah M B U U let's go check that out Malibu. boating season season out oh look even a little cup and handle going on here <laughs> ooh and the nice uptrend yeah it's really come up a long way so uh, people obviously been over this trade for a while I don't mind that chart stop yourself out under eighty though so. Okay. Chat's coming through now. Brunswick. Uh, Brunswick's the yeah. one I was thinking yeah. of. That'd be a good one, too. BC. That looks the same. That looks pretty good. They're perking up. Write these down. BC. Oh. We're interested here. Interesting ideas. What was the Malibu ticker symbol again? I got it. MB- I've never traded that one. MBUU. MBUU. Yeah. What yeah. about um? What about Mastercraft? This is from the chat now. M- MCFT Mastercraft. Boat holdings that yeah that mm. applies. Boat holdings on ETF. We need a boat ETF. Well, Mastercraft Boat Holdings is the company. Um, yeah. Camping World Outdoors. I dig it. I dig it. Coupon. Yeah, board. I dig that too. Um, what else do we got here? I'm, I'm going from chat. Vmar. Can it, wait? What is this? Canadian Electric Vo- Boats. V M A R. Yeah, I've had that one for a while. That one did not work out well. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of those EV plays that somebody like pitched me. I don't know where I got it from, and they're like, "This is EV boats." I like. Okay, I'll take a, a dive, and I am down significantly in this. <laughs> wait, wait. Bag holder and VMAR, or VMAR, electric boats. That was when the EVs were cool back in January. I was like, oh, this play will take off. I actually got up in it right away. I was like, this is going to be a good one. No. And I wrote it all the way down. This was one I did not stop myself out on. Should stop yourself out on stuff. Yeah. Uh, D-O-O-O makes jet skis. Is, is that Sea-Doo? Is that that company? Maybe. Holy uh, chat. 
chat rocks, man. Chat. Our chat is a lot smarter than us. Yeah, they, they know. This is what it's all about. They're a lot smarter than us. Definitely, they, definitely they, the due diligence for us is our chat. I mean, they just come up with so many good ideas in there. Love our chat. Yeah, yeah. It, now, it. now they're all flying. Thor, which we've mentioned previously, yeah, it's yeah. a good one. Um, like Polaris is, was one I was thinking yeah, of, too. Polaris is a good one. P.O.L. That's more jet skis, though. Where's my or that's pull hey, outdoor play. That's outdoor right near the place. top too. PII is looking ready uh, to go too. Yeah, yeah. I, all those, all those ticker symbols. Let's create a Benzinga ETF. Already and buy all already these creating the watch list. Already on the watch. Oh, list. already on it. I'm working. We're, today I'm working we're today. going. We're we're liking these stocks. We don't do recommendations, but I kind of like some. We're, of these we're, we're eyeing them. We're eyeing them. We're for eyeing them. We're, we're watching them. them. Yeah, we're watching them. And that's what it's about. All right, should we, let's talk Uber here for a hot second. Uh, Uber came out with some numbers uh, for March. I don't know. If, I don't remember if it was this morning now, or if it was over the weekend, or what. But they said that basically March was a, a an incredible quarter. Okay, um, gross bookings uh, crossed fifty two billion dollars on an annualized basis in March. That's up a hundred and fifty percent year over year. It's a record month. It was their best month for gross bookings in the company's twelve year history. They continue to believe that they are on track to reach quarterly adjusted EBITDA profitability this year. Wow. Um, How is that possible? Like in a pandemic that Uber is having more Uber, does this I, mean like more Uber rides than no, ever? I think it's all Uber Eats, honestly. I is think, it all Uber Eats? I think, it's all, we talk, I we, think you're right. We saw this last summer. Yeah. It was, it was Uber all, Eats saved them, man. Yeah, it really did. Yeah, it's like DoorDash built into, you know, this is basically DoorDash, right? The Uber Eats. What's the difference between DoorDash and Uber Eats? None. None. I'd rather own Uber than DoorDash because you get that whole, you know, we once we get back, Uber we know was taking over the taxi world. Yeah. So I don't know. The DoorDash stock stopped going down too, though, which is somewhat interesting. But at least it's slowed down. Nice day for DoorDash on Friday. Did you see that reversal? Let's take it. That oh. was right off. We yeah. talked about the lows, man. That was a trading right off yeah. the lows. I, I hate. I still hate the stock, by the way. But I'll tell you, that's a nice candle. So now, if you are so inclined, now on a pullback, you have that low of 120. 120 is your stop out point. Get this back down. Maybe they start selling the rip a little bit. Get down to 130s. You take could take a shot. Again, I think some of these growth names are really beaten down. I think eventually we're going to see a relief rally. That's what that is. That candle. On DoorDash is a relief candle because it's just been so oversold. I mean, we went from 220 to 120, down 100 points in just over a month. So it got hammered. Now it's starting to show, hey, you know, it, it's you know, it's just oversold. So are they out of the woods? I don't think so. The valuation's still crazy. I'd rather own Uber. But on a pullback here, it's interesting as a trade. So let's go back to Uber. Uh, you got that relief rally in Dash on a Friday. Uh, Uber also had a good dev, 3%. It's up again in the pre-market this morning, thanks to that headline. Uh, Lyft, too, is also up in sympathy, which is interesting. They don't have any Eats like component no. to them? No. You know they're going to, though. Mitch, are they not going to follow suit here and eventually have Lyft well, Eats? That was always the differentiator, right? Was Uber, like Lyft was going to be super specific on ride hailing. Uber was more diversified, uh, and Lyft had their costs more under control and Uber didn't because they were expanding into other businesses that didn't necessarily work. Well, they worked during the pandemic, their Uber Eats, which Lyft didn't have. So it, it helped Uber and it hurt Lyft. Uh, but prior to the pandemic, that was that was the argument in favor of Lyft was, oh, my God, Uber's costs are out of control. They're never going to be able to be profitable because um, they're they've got their hands in multiple business models, none of which are really proven yet. Lyft was more focused. I don't know if they didn't. I don't know if they're going to be doing a, a Lyft Eats thing. No, I, I think you, you're right. You're pointing out the strategy differences here. It's kind of like comparing a DraftKings and let's say a pen or, or a pen stock. You know, th this is a, a, a battle here of spending money. Um, Uber is willing to spend the money. Lyft is working towards profitability. Um, I think you'll, you won't see that purchase reason why I think they're focused more on robo taxis. Yeah. Um, so I hard. think that's the focus is let, let's, let's make sure that we get our, our core business down, right. get it to a profitability, and then yeah. we can worry about acquisitions elsewhere. Yeah. That robo taxi business is going to be good too. Um, and, 
Yeah, and we I mean, should. It's called, five. Where do you think? When do you think we have full autonomy? Like how far? Like if we were predicting, and Chad will ask you that too. Are we five years out from that? Are we ten years out from that? Are we two years out from that? I tend to think between five and ten. My own personal opinion. What do you guys think? Kathy Wood thinks we're five years out. Five yeah. years out sounds right. I mean, so how do you make money from that? Maybe you do on the Ubers and the Lyfts. Maybe maybe it's a Tesla play because maybe Musk is going to be the first on it. You know, so arguments for Tesla. Or maybe it's going to be another yeah. player that we don't even think about. Yeah, and let's not forget, we were talking last week, I think, with Jason about uh, Kathy Wood's Tesla model and what, uh, what assumptions were baked into that. Another big assumption that we talked about besides insurance was the robo taxis. That's that a lot of that is, is baked into to Ark's bullish thesis on Tesla that they're going to be right there when it happens. So whether we're five years out, who can say? F- people in the chat saying five, someone's saying two, someone's saying fifteen to twenty. Uh, I don't think years. we're fifteen to twenty. I think I, that's. I think we're closer. Than nine that. years, three years, ten. I years. think two. I you think, think two. So you're on the bullish end because that's there's a, full time. There's a reason like why, guys. Yeah. Why? Um, so you guys know I'm a SPAC man, right? And I follow a lot of these companies doing these LIDARs, right? Yeah. And so one of the things is if you can see under revenue predictions, you see in two years a big boost. That big boost to me shows that they get it down packed. Um, at least that's what they think so. Um, so in my eyes, I think there's a rush to get this done because there's such a rush for the demand of EVs. And to me, EVs don't really start moving until we get this technology down packed and yeah. people don't have to really drive. They can just hop in a car and sit back and relax. Yeah. Or are we just going to all get in our virtual world and not need cars anymore? We just, you know, ah, we can just drive around autonomously in our virtual world. And trade while we do it. Everything. Everything's done virtually. You just upload your head and you're gone. You don't have to worry about any of this stuff. The fun one's going to be when you get that random small vehicle, like let's say like an FUV to deliver you food. And then you look in the passenger seat and your food's just sitting there. There's nobody driving it. It's yeah. just, it literally just pulls up to you with your okay. food in the passenger seat. That's COVID friendly too. No passenger vehicle. Yeah. You don't have no driver risk that the driver sneezed on your food. Man, they, we they come just up with open all the, the ideas card, for all these in, companies. Send it to yeah. your house. I'm good. I'm good with that. And then and and we, and we make them all electric too, right? So yeah. everything. Uh, electric. Yeah. Everything's electric. We're done with gas. Gas is over. The gas trade. I'm officially killing it. Where is Exxon Mobil? Is oil going to 80s? No, it's gonna. It's. I think it topped out now. Stop. Where are we now in oil? Bring up the oil chart. Well, there's. I don't a- even have an oil chart because I don't pay for for futures. We know that because I'm a pro and they <laughs> want to ding me a bazillion dollars for futures quotes. Oil is so at- I have to like piggyback off you guys. Oil is at sixty. It's sixty oh five right now. Where is the chart? I need to see I, technicals. You want? I can see the XLE. I can see the XOP, but I can do not pay for oil futures All charts. Right. I, I don't hate here. Let me, let me pull. I don't have futures on on my pro. But... Uh, well, USO, I can bring that up myself. Yeah, all right. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you, futures. You want me to pull up a futures chart? God, let me. I got to show. That's okay. It's not that much of a concern. No, no, it shouldn't be. I mean, it, it's it's looking a little bit head and shoulderly, actually. If you if you want to see. Yeah, I can look at the XLE and I can look at the XOP and I feel like we chased and chased and chased and chased XLE all the way up. And you yeah. know what? We were very oversold back in October. It got, you know, Here, overdone. Dennis, Dennis, there. That that's this is oil. So Oh yeah, I think it's a sell. <laughs> Just my opinion. I think you sell the hell out of that. Sorry. Yeah. Don't not a fan. I think I think we've had the relief pop, but this 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 has been the reopening trade. The oil has been the reopening trade. Yeah. One, we just saw a horrible picture from Joel Alcon on Delta. That the reopening <laughs> might be not as close as we think it is. But two, is we still going electric? There's still you know this the, there there's still an electric. It, we're all going electric. So five years from now, there's just gonna be less demand for oil, I believe. So I think this was your out. I really believe if you have been holding all these oil stocks, you, and, you, and talking to the Canadians too, because like half the index is oil. So I think you're holding all these oil stocks. I think this is your pop to finally move out of. It's been a gift. We saw Chevron go from CBX, and it's still best in breed. If you had an oil stock, it's probably Chevron. $65 up to 110 all the way back. I mean, all a lot of these oil stocks have really come a long ways back. Halliburton was 5 bucks. Yes, that was overdone. It's back to $25. 
the money, easy money's been made. If you're jumping in here oil now for the reopening trade, you are three months too late. So I don't like oil. I didn't like it all the way up either, but I've hated it for a long time. I've hated it for years now. But I'm gonna I think now you've been given the out that you want. So if you're in oil stocks two years from now, they're all down. There's no complaining because I think you got the out today. Well, we liked it a few months ago when it was going up there, that relief rally. But as you said, that as a trade, maybe I've still never really gotten on board on this show on any oil stock. So I've completely missed <laughs> the re reopening trade on oil stocks. I was playing NCLH. I was playing American Airlines. I still was not touching Exxon and Chevron or XLE components or XOP components. I just can't get behind them because this world, first, the millennials like clean energy they're all about the environment they are eventually going to control the world because we're all be gone eventually so i still think we are going full electric if you're sitting with old dirty oil stocks and yes we use oil for a lot of other things but we're going to find technologies here man we will find clean ways to do most of our things we will not be reliant on fossil fuels nearly nearly as much going 30, 40 years from now, even 10 years from now. We're going to be less reliant on fossil fuels. That's my prediction. Well, let's talk Microsoft and uh, nuance here before we get Tim Quast on. We haven't gotten here yet on this show. I would like to. This is kind of the big headline from over the weekend. Bloomberg reported on Microsoft. I mean, uh, let me pull up the nuance chart. That's more indicative. Um, Microsoft is in talks, according to Bloomberg, to buy nuance communications. Uh, it would value new ones at around $56 a share. It comes out to $16 billion. This is interesting, right? Because Nuance is, of course, the company that was behind the speech recognition in Siri, which is Apple, right? Obviously. Um, and so a, a Microsoft acquisition would be very interesting on, on that front alone, just because Nuance uh, played such a critical role in the why does my chart keep doing that? Uh, in su such a critical role in the creation of Siri. Second thing I would note is Microsoft is they're buyers right now. They're doing a mm. lot of buying. They let's, are. Let's go back just just this year. Okay, they closed the acquisition of Zenimax, which is a, a video game developer, for seven and a half billion dollars. That closed in March. They announced they're going to buy Discord for ten million dollars. That was also in March. And now we got this nuance uh, report of a deal nothing confirmed yet for 16 billion dollars microsoft is spending spend some money they're buying growth yeah i mean they're buying the growth they want the growth they're buying the growth so discord now n-u-a-n yeah this still just rumors here up 10 bucks i usually like to ring the register if it's just rumors oh wait stock pops oh, 23 nope, nope. Or is it official now is not a rumor anymore as of two minutes ago Oh, Microsoft, just, it's announced now. It is announced. Microsoft confirmed an uh, all-cash deal valued at values new ones at nineteen point seven billion dollars. So that is fifty-six dollars a share in nuance. N U N N U A N. Sorry. Is it halted right now? It is. It's halted. Yeah, that just happened. It's that, halted. Just, that just happened. Because right, I was looking, and you know, it's fifty-eight bid, but fifty-five offers. Oh, that's a halt because <laughs> yeah. it's crossed. So I can see the book where you obviously got bids below, bid, people paying way up and then people offering down. So yeah. it is halted right now. 56 is the confirmed price, cash. Yep, yep. We know how this trade. It'll trade right to 56 and possibly a little bit higher because people like, oh, maybe somebody will pay more. Like when Glue Mobile got bought out for cash and the thing went you know, 50 cents above. Yeah. I'm a big fan. When they trade a dollar or two above the takeout price, you sell them because usually there isn't another bidder coming. Yeah. So, you know, you're just getting bonus money. And why wait for your money? Move on. There's better places for your money. I mean, we were in a market that every, you know, a lot of different things are ripping all the time. So, and you're ringing the register on NUAN. You might even get above 56. It would not surprise me because that's the way this market is. What's Microsoft doing on this? Good question. Down 40 cents. Oh, they're, they're hit the acquirer. Hit the acquirer, as always. Little bit, not much. That's just overall Little market bit. effects, and it's a small. That's just you know, nineteen billion dollars. What's the market cap of Microsoft? This is a drop in the bucket. Is really. a, a literal drop in the bucket from Microsoft. like a literal drop in the bucket. We're talking about a, a one point five trillion. What's Microsoft worth? Uh, Let's look. Um, where's you literally are talking very small. One point one point seven trillion dollars. That's a pretty good guess. One point seven trillion yeah. by nineteen billion. There, that's a drop in the bucket. Yeah. All right, it is 8.35 on Monday, which means it's time for Market Structure Mondays.
Tim Quash joining us now. He is the founder and CEO of Market Structure Edge. Tim joins us every week from a different location. He does, man. He <laughs> owns like 25 homes. Where are you now? <laughs> this guy owns hey. homes everywhere. Bullish and homes. All nice. uh, and, and, if, and if you use Market Structure Edge, you too can own 25 homes. <laughs> exactly. There That's you go. That's a great pitch right there. <laughs> <laughs> I get Market Structure Edge. Yeah. I want to own 25 homes. I don't even own one home right now, I don't think. <laughs> Dennis, My other one's uh, bulldozed. And <laughs> Dennis, Dennis might be homeless, I guess I got a rental, but... <laughs> <laughs> Good I'm going to be you. homeless pretty soon. You're going to have to come yeah. feed me on the come, street. All these come, stock tips I've given you over the years, you guys are going to have to like throw some money in my can, some Bitcoin in my can. Come stay in one of mine, Dennis. You can come, come stay in one of mine. All right, I'm taking you up on that. <laughs> I should do that right now. <laughs> What's going on, Tim? What's up? Well, it should be a very interesting week for fans of market structure, right? Oh, <clears throat> Uh, I, these are always fascinating weeks to me that where we, we kick off an earnings season yeah. and uh, we always begin with the big banks, which are to me, Dennis, I don't know how you feel about this. I'm not a great fan of, uh, of uh, trading the banks, but there are occasionally opportunities in those. Mm -hmm. But the, then, then this always slams uh, uh, in, a, in a clash of titans fashion, one of the phrases I like to use, uh, into options expirations, and and it always gets short shrift. So to and it, I think it's very important for traders to understand how those things work together. Uh, so we have options expiring Thursday and Friday, and then we spill into next week and Monday a new series trades. Uh, <clears throat> then the banks will true up their books related to the expiring options and the new options. Uh, that begin trading on Tuesday. Then you have VIX expirations on Wednesday. We finally clear our way out of the turbulence Thursday or Friday. And the problem is that everybody thinks it relates to, you know, Microsoft buying Nuance, which you were just talking about, or uh, that how the banks perform, or Delta Airlines, big, big company that's reporting results this week. And they misinterpret what the, the market is telling them. And I'm not saying that the market will surprise people, but I'm saying that there is a possibility of it because it, you'll, you'll remember that we talked about uh, how tech would outperform. Early in April, uh, I said tech is going to be the place to be again, no matter how much you hear this discussion about the, uh, the reopen trade and a shift back to value and the stocks that had done well. And there are always outliers and exceptions. Clearly, Zoom hasn't done uh, well, but Microsoft sure has. <laughs> look at look how well yeah. Microsoft has done. Yeah. And, it, and it comes back to the construction of the market and what the money does today. No matter how much you and I and all the pundits on, you can just see the edge of CNBC behind me there uh, on the TV, how much the discussion is about uh, people thinking about how some company is going to perform, uh, that that is the driver of the market. It's not. It was in 2000, it's not in 2021 because yeah. it's not what the money's doing. Uh, money will allocate, it to, uh, allocate itself to assets. And we can see this, by the way, in the data and it will periodically make shifts. So the question really is for all of us, what should we expect as, as earnings begin and options expire? And we can go back uh, to, to March, just as a, pre a precursor, because I think it's very telling, not because of earnings, but because of what happened there. So you have this huge hedge fund blow up, Arkegos Capital, <clears throat> and <clears throat> the significance of that isn't that Arkegos lost $8 billion, it's that there were six big prime brokers involved in this, and all of those instruments reset the end of this week and next week. And what will their appetite for risk be? What will be the cost of leverage after an experience like that? Well, I would submit to you that the cost of leverage is going to go up and the appetite for risk on the part of big banks is going to go down. And I think that those things could be harmful to the markets. I don't think it will happen right away, but I think that you get to about Tuesday, Wednesday next week, we could have a sudden uh, rumble through the markets that people will attribute to uh, uh, an expectation that was overhyped for earnings, and it won't be that at all. And I'll show you a couple of things related to that. Yeah, when you say those instruments reset, what do you mean? 
So <clears throat> whether you use options or futures or very, there are all kinds of swap contracts from, uh, you know, you heard, hear this uh, discussion about total return swaps, yeah. uh, <clears throat> contracts for difference. Uh, these are all ways to try to pursue the economic return in different baskets of things without actually having to own them. So the bank will take the risk of having to go cover it and a hedge fund will bet on the likelihood that they will get paid that economic return and their risk is having to pay a fee or put up collateral like Archegos did. Archegos put up its portfolio as collateral for a heavily leveraged bet and then the, ask, the bet failed and they not only lost their, their collateral, right? The, it's like putting your house up to bet on Bitcoin and you get a bunch of Bitcoin and you're holding it in an account and then your Bitcoin is sold and, and you lose your house too. That's, that's the equivalent here. And so that's what happened in March. So will banks want to take that kind of bet again? I don't think so. I don't, not to the same degree. So to summarize that point, you are expecting what in the next week and a half? Oh, okay. Great, great. And let's look at a couple of things to understand this. So I'm going to share my screen. Sure. And uh, the traders, you can do this too. Just go to marketstructureedge.com. You can use this for free for 14 days. You don't need a credit card. And it's just a way to change your thinking about what drives the market. <clears throat> Dennis has talked about this for a long time about the, the importance of the rules and how those rules affect the way things trade. So for instance, here, uh, I've got Microsoft on the screen because you happen to be talking about them. People started to bet on a deal in Microsoft that Microsoft would pursue something right here. How do we know? Well, because short volume, that is the percentage of daily trading volume coming from borrowed stock dropped to what we call our deal threshold level at about 30%. You can see that, traders. Wait, wait, on. Can, can you explain why would that indicate? Like, <clears throat> why is what is the deal threshold? Why would that indicate? That? Okay, so so it's important to understand that that about half of all market volume, forty five percent of it, comes from borrowed stock. It when you see a bunch of volume out there, half of that volume isn't coming from owners meeting owners. It's people furnishing borrowed yeah. stock. Okay, <clears throat> so. When that level drops near 30%, and we've seen this for 15 years in deal stocks, we're very, very good at tracking M&A arbitrage. And our analytics are used all the time by big public companies for that purpose. And here's what happens and why it's such a tell for deals. So when it drops to 30%, you can conclude two things. Number one, the cost to borrow that stock has risen. And machines that just go around the market scooping up cheap stuff to borrow and furnish to the market because they just want to intermediate the intraday volatility, which, by the way, in the S&P 500 is 300 basis points every day. People don't understand how much movement there is. So machines will intermediate that and go long and short based on how average prices are behaving. But when the cost rises, you get excluded from a basket. And if there are deal arbs walking around and talking to people who actually are thinking and who hold Microsoft, uh, that those owners may not want to loan their securities out. So the levels decline. And we can look at what happened to Nuance as well. And we will see a move in that, 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 that people didn't figure that out until about a week ago. But here for about two weeks, people thought Microsoft is going to do a big deal. So we want to be long Microsoft not short Microsoft. And that whole attitude per pervaded the market and it showed up in this steep drop from the normal levels of shorting for Microsoft to a level that was very abnormally low and right at that 30% threshold. Uh, so can you, can you explain why would I indicate that a deal is imminent though? I, I guess because people, people want to keep their stock, right? They don't know which direction this goes, but generally deals in our era are good for stocks. If there is a battle, they may not necessarily be. Uh, <clears throat> and I can give you lots of cases in point uh, uh, to, to illustrate that that feature of the markets today, but that's what it is. It says, we believe something is going to happen. So for owners of the stock, we want to be long and people will bet that, okay, now let's go try to figure out who it might be. That's what it's really comes down to that when the, and it, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, 
It's a principle of the market that applies in more ways than one. Deal stocks diverge from norms and, and passive money wants stocks that track benchmarks. So you begin when, when short volume drops or when behaviors begin to change in the marketplace, those things get excluded. But the big reason is owners don't want to lend out their securities. That's all you have to know. Okay. And, and you'll see it show up in, in short volume. Look at nuance here. So nuance was well over 50% short uh, just back here at the end during, during month end window dressing. The, the, this stock was 73% short. Then it imploded. It dropped from 73% short all the way down to 30. There is your deal threshold level. And so there was confirmation from the deal arbs that probably nuance was the target. And that arrived at on April 6th. So not very long ago, but long enough ago to tell you that all the deal arbs had shifted from short nuance on its fundamentals to long nuance on its M&A uh, attributes. And there you go. And you will often see that. Now, I'm not telling you you can go sift through all the data, but what you can do, if there is a rumor that develops, you can go look at the data. So let's go look at the short volume. And where did it change? And what, what are people doing around options expirations? And it's a definite tell. We, we were, now that it's public, I'll tell you that we supported uh, Chevron in its acquisition of a company uh, Noble Energy some time ago, and uh, we looked at the data and we said, you're going to have competition in this deal. And because uh, uh, we could see it in the patterns, uh, active money would not buy the stock and short volume continued to decline. And son of a gun, along came Carl Icahn. That was the, that was the, he wanted a bone and he's very good at it. He's very good at getting a bone out of a transaction rather than that he will publicly resist it. But then once he receives something that he wants, then he will embrace that deal. But we could see it coming because of these very characteristics. And it often shows up this way. And traders, you can use that to your advantage. So there's a rumor, go put it in a portfolio at Market Structure Edge and look at it and see what happens. If you see a dramatic change in short volume like that, that's a pretty good tell that there's going to be some news coming. When you're looking at you know the sentiment on the top chart, is it really when it starts crossing over? Is when you start getting interesting from the long side? When you start seeing because you know when you're pointing these yeah. out, it's like it seems like it's when sentiment crosses over. It's hanging out below, below, below the closing yep. price, and then market structure sentiment seems to start to you know drift higher and then starts right. crossing over. Is that where you're looking to strike? Is usually on those crossovers. You, there are three ways that we look at sentiment, and what Dennis is talking about, folks, is see, you have this line, the smoother line. Yeah. This is this is sentiment. It's a it's a supply demand measure. That's what it is. And then here's price. So we're just comparing supply and demand in the movement of prices. So you can see here, price moved up because of short covering right there. Sentiment ticked up. Oftentimes, that's one of three. So there's the the three ways that we look at sentiment are: does it tick up? Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. We had, there was this, that's about 30%, right? Uh, does it cross over five? That is actually about 83% right. The challenge here was this was options expirations. This is where Archegos blew up and it caused all kinds of trouble in the market. It caused, uh, uh, it caused people to abandon their strategies left and right. And uh, we saw that show up in the data. And then number th the, the third way is to buy ones and, and then sell at mean reversion. So you buy an uptick, sell a down tick, or a combination of those. Buy when you cross over five because now sentiment is, uh, demand exceeds supply because the, the axis is five. So you wanna generally own stuff that is above five. Stuff that is at five, like the banks, tend to reflect how the market moves. And we can look at Morgan, uh, JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs, if you like. And then, uh, and then uh, upticks and down ticks. It's those three things that, that will give you 90% of the opportunity to catch short terms, short term moves. You know, I think in terms of five to seven days, that's it. Let, let's look at Goldman Sachs because okay. they're going to report earnings on Wednesday. So kind of get the feel for the sentiment going into the report okay. um, and what the market thinks. So here, you know, here's Benzinga April 12th. <laughs> that's, that's the name of the portfolio. And I'll look right across. He's got the whole portfolio bill the, right off of our, our earnings calendar. Nice. There it is, right? So, so there's Goldman Sachs. It's a five and topped. It is mean reverted. Short volume is at 49%, but we want to go look at the, the trend. Trades $19,000 a trade. Very liquid stock. 
so now let's go look at the, the, the data here. And I like to back this up just a little bit so we can look at the longer term trend. Back yeah. it up to three months. Let's look at what sentiment has done. You can see that here it, it's not going to do as well as it did. Uh, this this was the great time to buy Goldman Sachs when it ticked zero up. Zero or right? one. One, it's yeah. at one and it ticked up and you stay in it all the way until it drops below five. There's your all you would have captured all the gains. And but and now it's ticked back up, but it stopped. It topped at five, telling us, and now go look at short volume, right at trend, but very close to 50%. Notice here again, this is this is where uh, initially Goldman Sachs went went long uh, opposite Archegos, then it shorted Archegos's position right there. So they knew by the time options expired that that, that trade of Archegos was going to blow up. But right now it tells us that this does not offer a lot of upside. I think Goldman Sachs will be up a little bit with results, but it tells us people have straddled it. That's what it tells us. If sentiment is 5.0 and short volume is half of the volume, that's a long short trade now. And the kind of gains that we saw from Goldman Sachs are not going to be there this time around. Uh, that's what the data are telling us now. The easy money has been made. The easy money has been made. All the bets on on uh, the the reopen trade and the and maybe rising interest rates and therefore better returns on the books for Goldman Sachs that is baked in and it's no longer there. That's what the data tell us. Now we can check that next Monday. But you know, look and look back. What did we talk about? Tech. Tech would do well. That was correct, and it was based purely on these data. You're not talking so much the numbers as much as you are the reaction to the numbers, right? Exactly. The the supposition, the numbers will probably be very good, but the supposition that those numbers dr dr uh, drive the behavior of money in the market is where the logic breaks down. For that to be true, 80% of the money in the market would have to be following rational thought. Well, that has not been true since about 2001. <laughs> Today, 9% nine, <laughs> nine of the volume comes from rational thought. So what this tells us is that passive money is no longer increasing its allocations to financials. That's not where the money's going. And so without that money, those stocks are not going to rise no matter how good their financial performance. And look, I'm not, I think they could do fine and have a little uptick with results because they're right at the axis of five. There, there's neither greater demand than supply nor the reverse of that. But it tells us that's not where the money's going, not where the money's going. In fact, the whole market is topped heading into options expirations. If we look at, uh, I could have just hit it. Let's just look at broad market sentiment. So this is a measure of that whole supply demand waxing and waning feature that the market's got. Topped, market's decline. Topped, market's decline. This thing was weird because of the Archegos capital blow up, but it is not the thing to look at. See, the market actually fell before sentiment topped. Where are we now? We're topping again. So statistically, the likelihood that the market goes higher next week is very low. And the, the likelihood that it declines and then people improperly attribute it to, oh, we got overexcited about the reopen trade, the companies aren't performing as well. It will not be that. It will be the fact that passive money has already allocated its assets. And if it does not continue to do that, the market will decline. It's that simple. All right. We'll have to find out. Tim Quast is the founder and CEO of Market Structure Edge. Joins us every Monday for Market Structure Mondays. Tim, always a pleasure. I look forward to your next house next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have 50 a good houses week, in 50 weeks. That's what <laughs> That's we want. Tim, you got to buy some more houses. <laughs> That's right. I got, I got to get to it. So if you'll excuse me, right. I need to go buy a house. Go on right. Zillow. All right. Go on Zillow. <laughs> go on Redfin. Go on Zillow. All right. Let's do some questions from chat before our next guest here. Uh, unless there was anything else, Dennis, I don't know if you want to talk pot at all, but we had a free earnings. And yeah. Dragging, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. They're dragging pot down this morning. Last I checked, which hasn't been for like a half hour or so, but a free reported uh, earnings per share, a uh, buck 14 loss Canadian last quarter, which is down year over year. They made money uh, in, in Q1 20, or I guess their Q3, their Q3 2020. They lost money in Q3 2021. Sales did increase $9 million year over year from 144 to 153. So those numbers don't inspire confidence. I know they're supposed to vote on the Tilray merger this week. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly when that vote is supposed to go down, but regardless, um, the number, the free numbers 
throwing Spartans in confidence, and as of this morning, at least last I checked, they were dragging down pot with it. Lower the move, 1378. That was back yep. on March the 5th. That's the level it absolutely needs to hold. Again, valuations, you know, crazy on this stock. It has been for a long time, but we didn't care about valuation back in February. We do in March. I mean, that's why, you know, stocks come down significantly from those highs. Um, I've had this one wrong, so whatever I say, probably <laughs> I, I, I've 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 been bearish this stock for a long time, and you know I had the ridiculous rally in January and February, which I did not see coming. But again, when we got January and February, we we threw valuation right out the window. We were just buying everything, and that's when all growth stocks top. This is a growth stock. This is one of the higher valuation, you know, high high growth names, and you know the valuation just you know got overdone. The stock got overdone. The stock prices come in. Is there a buying point at a certain time? I mean, if you wanted to try it, you got to lean on that 1378. I would not want to see it take that out. So it, I do. I have been saying that I think growth is oversold. In this case, I believe a free is probably oversold in the short term too, but it's there's a lot nicer looking charts in this one as opposed to trying to pick a bottom on a stock that just disappointed the street. Yeah. Uh, Bravo Mo asking about Baba. Bravo Mo, rewind the show like... 40, to the beginning almost 40 minutes 45 minutes we talked about Bob yeah. at the top of the show i saw a question from one of our chats i think uh, earlier in the hour about lithium stocks um so all i did was pull off the lit etf and look at the, the top u.s holdings in that there aren't many um u.s holdings but alb is one for someone who for whoever yeah. was asking, alb tesla is obviously a big one um mineral resources which is min um ENS, these are all these are all top holdings in the LIT ETF, which I have up on the screen. I don't know if, if you watch the space closely, Dennis, or if you see a particular trade. Well, I've got a couple of the stocks in my long term yeah. portfolio. ALB was a screw up that I sold back during you know the March, right probably right after when it got up to April or May when they started to rebound there, and I it was a stock I wanted to hold forever, and I'm really regretting that I sold that. COVID scared me out of that. Um, LTHM, I own. I've sold. Yeah. I sold about three quarters of the position just because it got yeah. way overdone. LAC, same thing. I sold about three quarters of the position, but I still have a small piece. Okay. So I, I don't these these I still like lithium long term. They just I need to see some life. I haven't seen some life in anything yeah. that's you know trading, and a lot of these are trading with higher multiples. So again, these are growth names that you've got to see that EV trade turn around. You know, have we bottomed on some of these? I, I think you know if you wanted to nibble in some of these names, I think. I think it's a good idea, but that's just my opinion. I don't know long term. Like, there's still a valuation issue on some of these names too, so they're not cheap stocks. I just think as a trade, I think some of them are oversold, and eventually there may be a relief pop in some of these too. Uh, I don't know if you want to look at Ark Invest at all. Actually, speaking of Ark Invest, um, th this is this is why I love and also hate Twitter because there was an exchange over the weekend uh, yesterday on Twitter. Between Kathy Wood and Elon Musk, but it was so hard to follow that you had to know what you're looking for in order to find it, right? So, like, what happened was Elon had responded to uh, a, a Kathy Wood tweet, and her response to Elon's response was very hard to find. You had to go, I had to go to her her uh, profile to to find it. But basically, you had this whole yeah. This is why Twitter is awesome, right? Because you had this whole interaction between Kathy Wood and Elon. Yeah. But it was kind of a pain in the ass for me to find it. Um, basically, he asked her, "What do you think of the unusually high ratio of S and P market cap to GDP?" That's that's the Buffett indicator, um, and she sent this whole thing. Right, uh, this whole screen. But I thought it was great. It was just really hard to find. So I don't know. Uh, thought that was interesting. I don't know if you, Kathy yeah. stocks. I, again, I've said they've been oversold. A lot of those names in her portfolio. There's been a few that so she's had some really good ones too. But a lot of the names are oversold. She's been buying. I think there's could be a relief pop. Again, I was waiting for one in Teladoc here. It's just hanging out, hanging out. It doesn't seem to want to go. So you are playing. The, the one thing is you're going against the momentum. The momentum is still to the downside. So if the market starts to roll over, it's probably going to be these growth names that lead the charge. I keep thinking we might get a relief pop in some of these names. So I've nibbled into a few. But I'm definitely not all in on the growth names. And in the long-term portfolio, I've bought none of these names because it's, you know, I've got to be able to stop myself out because, yep. you know, I just don't like paying crazy multiples. So I, I, I'm i still challenging her core strategy of growth at any cost. I always like growth at a reasonable cost. But, you know, you can't argue with performance. She's still performed very well. She's outperformed, you know, my long-term portfolio in the last year. Or so yeah, I just don't know. If this is like you look at ARKK and is this 
the consolidation station to go higher or is she just running a major resistance it's still to be determined if our arkk if we can get above 125 then you start thinking okay now we got 130 and then we can start maybe breaking this downtrend and start moving higher you got the nice double bottom in place which is good news so technically it doesn't look bad that's why i keep nibbling on i'm almost looking at this chart and saying the growth names maybe these higher valuation names start to get some life so I'm, I'm kind of on board short term on this trade right now but again if i'm long these kathy names you absolutely gotta stop yourself up below 120 on arkk i don't know about you but the more it goes sideways the more bullish i get yeah a, a little bit but it's such a market where nobody knows this is a really tough market to call and this is why you know i make most of my money not off market calls i make my money off of market inefficiencies right you know like an inefficiency has been the SPY gets jacked up every single night, it seems like, and every single, um, you know, 3.30 to 4 o'clock, you know, it was 3.30 ramp. Remember, ramp capital created his handle for that reason. That is just oh, been the trade. I, I didn't know Buying that. Buying at 3.30 in the last week has been making money every single day. You find these little inefficiencies, little yeah. patterns that nobody's identifying and try to exploit those. I don't know if that's going to continue this week, but I continue to play those things until they don't work. Huh. I didn't realize that was the reason for the, behind the ramp capital name. I think so. I think that's where it was, the 330 ramp capital. Ramp capital. Huh. So right. it's 330 ramp. is back. Like So this has just been going on for the last – been going on for years. Yeah. 330 ramp, we were talking about zero. Hedge talking about it four, four years ago, five years ago. They yeah. jack it up into the close. They jack them up into the close. I mean, the jack the, – this is spy – Ramping it up into the close there on Friday was ridiculous. We went up at 3.30. We were 4.09 on the SPY, and we went up to 4. So we were getting 25 handles in the last 30 minutes. Right there. Right there. That's just a ridiculous ramp up. And there were some moves on individual stocks, too, that were just ridiculous. So, I mean, this is opportunities, though. And I often do fade those moves when, they're ridic when they really move up into the close. I'll short them. And then maybe buy some other stocks against it. You know, and I'm usually trading hedged, but you know, sometimes I'm just naked and I just wait for the coming too. Usually, if they're it's on like an option expiration and they really jack into the close, usually it comes in after hours. So you know, sometimes I'm playing in those ways too. I like the fade trade, but sometimes I'm going with the momentum. It's all just you know, I've got a bucket of strategies which I talk about on the show. It's probably a hundred strategies. It's just like identifying the parameters on when to use which strategy. I mean, that's what this market is all about. It's creating, and that's what the show is about. It's creating tools for your toolbox. I probably have a hundred different tools for a hundred different markets. And, you know, you've got to identify which tool to use in this case. So all we are, you know, is we're, you know, just working the markets with the tools that we have created or we've figured out. So as you figure out more tools, you put in your toolbox. That tool's not working right now, you go to a different tool. But you can always find different tools that are working, different strategies for different markets. Right now, it's a very, uh, it's a market that's a lot of rotation. Identifying the rotation early in the day has been successful. But like this 330, where they just start buying everything, has been, you know, that ramp capital tool has been working the last three or four days. So I keep playing those, using those tools until they don't work. All right. Uh that, let's let's talk IPOs here. Let's bring on Matt Hammond from IPO Warriors. As I mentioned at the top, this is going to be the biggest week of the year on the IPO front because of Coinbase, which is Wednesday. Dennis, have a good day. We'll say goodbye to you. We'll say hello to Matt. Matt, where, where did Matt go? Matt, are you ex as excited as I am for Coinbase on Wednesday? I am stoked. I am so stoked. I'm soaked. Um, when Dennis <laughs> just talked about different tools, IPO plays is one of those tools that you can develop into your uh, trading strategy. And especially when IPOs are hot, they kind of, they set each other off. And last week we talked about UTME uh, on the show. We talked about low float Chinese stocks. Uh, me, UTME. Yeah, yeah, let's start with UTME and then we'll go to okay, the it, 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 Let me get my screen up here. What was that? Explain that. What was that? Okay. So UTME was a or is a Chinese OEM, kind of like Foxconn. They build cell phones for other manufacturers uh, or for other brands. Okay, so uh, they have a real business. They have a real business and they have some pretty big customers. Uh, yeah. Hire, which makes a lot of washing machines and appliances. They build the cell phones for that company. They do have some of their own product lines. They make a high-end line of Android phones, mostly for the domestic market in China. But they also make sort of like low-tech phones for developing nations. So they have a pretty established business. It's just, we've never heard of them and it's 
probably not that exciting of a stock. The price we all expect it to cool off and come down, but it's not the first time we've seen a Chinese IPO that none of us have heard of. I think WNW was the first one that just ripped from about seven or eight dollars, and then the, by the third or fourth day, it was up to one hundred and sixty dollars. Uh, so these things catch fire and then it has nothing to do with the stock anymore. It's just a momentum play. There's super low float and they just trade into halt after halt after halt. And UTME, uh, it traded into, I think, nine halts in a row and I actually was in on this on the debut. I bought it at 1140 and just got out after the first halt, unfortunately. Uh, still a nice you know, 35% win, but nothing like the 940% win you could have taken if you held through to the second day. And we saw a similar impact of uh, you know, VECT on Friday, and we'll get to that in a second one. But the theme of last week was low floated, the stock exploded. And we're going to see some of that uh, coming up this week, which on top of Coinbase makes me really excited about this week. Uh, kind of already went over UTME, opened at 1140, went straight through nine halts and peaked at 46. So from 1140 to 46. It then came back and sort of like mellowed out and something that you rarely see, it halted into the close. So with about nine minutes left in the first day, it halted at 37 and just sat there. And then as soon as it opened uh, in the after hours, it just exploded up to 50. Uh, so we see up here, and then there was some pretty wild uh, after hours and then pre-market. And then the next day, it just ran all the way up to 107. More halts on the way up, more halts on the way down. It just sort of that insanity that hype and hysteria causes caught on. And after that, the stock price becomes unhinged and it sort of takes on a life of its own. We saw something a little bit similar here in Vective Bio, which is a biotech. And I typically don't like to play these, but it only had 7 million shares floated, which is relatively low. And initially debuted just above the IPO price and sort of settled out. And then at some point, Twitter or somebody got a hold of the idea that, hey, this is low float too. Remember UTME? and it just shot straight up into a pair of halts and then climbed all the way up to 37.70 before finally cooling back down to a normal 24.02. And I think right now it's pre-market at like $22, which is essentially where it opened. Um, again, no rhyme or reason for this. I doubt anybody who bought into it understood anything about what Vective Bio does. It just sort of caught on and you know exploded. So. Bearing that in mind, let's look at what's on the calendar for yes. this week. Let's look ahead. What do we got? We have, we have a lot. I mean, everyone's eyes are going to be on Coinbase, and no doubt that's going to be a super hot uh, direct listing. It's actually not an IPO, which I like even better because it means we're not going to have all the institutional investors buying in before retail guys like us get a chance to buy. And we tend to see the debut sort of like with Roblox, that debut price of Roblox is $64 has maintained a base level that we've been able to sort of rely on as a floor. And anyone who bought in at that debut price because the stock has been so hot is pretty much assured of profits or the opportunity to sell for a profit either on the opening day, the next day, or you know for several weeks until if there's some reason for it to correct downwards. Otherwise, it's probably gonna just sort of ride that trend. With Coinbase, we know crypto has been super hot again the last two months. It's just Bitcoin's exploded. All the other boats in the ocean have rose with it. And Coinbase's numbers, which we'll look at in a second here, have been insane. They released earnings last week. And as we'll see, there's a reason that everybody's excited about not only what the stock is doing right now, but what it's poised to do in the future, assuming that crypto doesn't blow up, which is probably the only um, big, big risk of, uh, of Coinbase. And it is a substantial risk and something you want to consider for if, if you're looking at this as a long-term hold. But we have a couple others. We have eSports Technologies, which I've starred the stocks here that have a float less than 5 million because I see that as sort of a threshold where people key in on it and it tends to have an explosive effect on the, on the share price, especially when it first debuts. So eSports Technologies is a, an eSports and normal sports betting platform. It allows people to bet on games like Counter-Strike, but also on regular basketball and baseball, soccer games. And it's primarily focused in Asia, but it is based out of Las Vegas. So it's a new company. They don't have a lot of revenues. They don't have a lot of history. But we all know that eSports and gambling is, are, are pretty hot plays. And this was a click IPO offering that people were able to buy or submit a request to buy through Webull. I actually put in a request myself. 
Um, but it sold out in about one day, which indicates that the 2 million shares that are, that, that are being floated were snapped up right away. And if you look on Twitter and check out what people are saying about the ticker eBet, you'll see that there's a lot of hype and a lot of interest and people are already making the comparisons to UTME. So it's worth buying this, I think, to play for a scalp trade. I don't think I want to hold it long term. Maybe get out each at each halt, uh, shave a little bit of your position off and give it a chance, give at least part of your position a chance to run into that second day spike. And then, you know, put it aside, get out of it and look towards the next IPOs, uh, Coinbase is the next day. So um, that that kind of gives you a, if you've never played an IPO, eBet would be a fun one to kind of cut your teeth on and, and then you can get into Coinbase. Incidentally, I have put together a trading guide. It's about 20 pages on how to play the IPO debut. If you go to ipowarriors.com, sign up for the newsletter, you'll get that guide sent to you. You have time to review it. You have time to prepare for the IPOs this week with a major focus on uh, playing the Coinbase IPO, buying it right at the debut and looking for exit points to maximize profits on the spike off the debut. Another one is Infobird, and this is a Chinese IPO. It's got 6 million shares, so not super low float, and it has been available on Webull for about a week now, which shows me that maybe it's not as hot as some of the other ones, but it is artificial intelligence, it is customer service, and it, it, it's interesting to look at just to see kind of what the tr if the trend holds for these Chinese IPOs to, uh, to blow up. Coinbase, we'll get to that in a second. Alchemy Technology, it's on the calendar. It's a cloud SaaS solutions for kind of smaller banks and credit institutions. Carrot packaging. This one's pretty interesting because the float is so low. We'll get to that in a second. Too simple, automated freight driving, app loving, uh, they, a mobile app developer and a mobile advertising platform that other apps can use to monetize their apps. And Agilon Health uh, thrown in the mix as well. Let's go through these individually. And um, I kind of touched on them earlier, so I'll, I'll skip over some of these. eBet we talked about. Main thing here is it's a hot topic, esports and eBetting, it's gambling, and the float is just 2 million shares. The demand on Click IPO showed that people want this and the comparisons to UTME make this a pretty one to hard one to pass up. I'll definitely be playing this one. Infobird, as I mentioned, Chinese artificial intelligence, pretty small float. The chairman is a former HP executive, so you know this isn't some garbage company. Uh, likely, we have some credibility, but it has been available on Click IPO for about a week, which means that they haven't sold out of shares, and which means I'm a little bit hesitant to move on this because there's a good chance that people who do get allocated those shares dump on any kind of premium off the debut. So if it's they buy it for five and it debuts at eight. A lot of people just say, oh, that's cool. I'll take that win and just sell out. And we'll see that we've seen a lot of these click IPO stocks drop right off the off the opening. Now we're to kind of the big daddy of the week uh, and possibly of the year with Coinbase. The hype for this has been as intense as you can hope for for any kind of IPO or direct listing. You know, when you're playing an IPO, you really are counting on like a traditional IPO. You're really counting on retail demand to drive that spike off the debut because the institutions, the big hedge funds, uh, pensions, uh, high net worth individuals, they've been able to buy into the IPO at the IPO price. So with Snowflake, we saw the price debut at 245, but the IPO price was 120, which meant that all the, you know, the big spike that came off the debut was all driven by retail demand. Coinbase is different because it's a direct listing. Now, the direct listing, we don't have all the investment banks, we don't have all the hedge funds, we don't have all the big money piling in before we get to buy in. Now, a lot of them might sit back and relax and say, hey, wait, there's no rush, we don't have to buy in on day one, but a lot of them will. And a lot of retail, it's basically everyone starting at the same starting line, which I think puts us at a, at a better advantage than we get at the typical IPO. It is the largest crypto wallet, has 56 million customers, up 30% in the last three months has 7,000 institutions, 115,000 partners, and operates in over 100 countries. I mean, this, this thing is massive. It is the way that the world trades crypto. It's super easy to use when, you know, I, I, I've traded very limited crypto, but when I did, Coinbase made it so easy that it was kind of like, oh, this isn't, this isn't as hard as I thought it was. It wasn't as hard as it was 10 years ago where you had to 
really jump through so many hoops to figure out, you know, how to how to buy and store your your crypto. This makes it super easy. Yeah. Had six million transacting users last month, which is far more than any other uh, crypto wallet. It had it announced 1.8 billion quarterly billion dollar quarterly revenue, yeah. which is just huge. And they made more money last quarter than they made all last year. Exactly. And yeah, it was something up like 300 percent from you know quarterly comparison to last year. Um, and the net income expected range projected going forward is 730 to 800 million dollars. So this the Coinbase is is they're profitable. They're minting money basically out of Bitcoin and crypto, and it's you know it, it's one of those IPOs that just you get excited. It's like Super Bowl week for me. Um, Wait, I get super excited question, going up to yeah. question from AJ in chat, and I doubt there's an answer to this. Do you know what time the IPO is, or do we, we won't know that yet? Okay, this is something I cover in the guide, and we don't know with IPOs. Okay, the way an IPO works, and I and I go into this in great deal. Go to IPOWarriors.com, sign up for the newsletter, you get the guide. I explain how the the process works so that you get a better understanding of what is happening in on the day of the IPO. And what is and the quick version is they are balancing the market makers are balancing how many shares are being offered to how many people want to buy the you know, buy the stock and they're trying to figure out what price to offer it at. And you can actually see this price and get a sense of how close we are to going live. If you use an app like uh, Webull or E-Trade, they will show you the bid ask price. Webull, if it's, if it's one of the stocks that they're covering, will show you the, uh, the imbalance, which shows kind of how many shares they still haven't figured out how to, you know, how to price at a certain price. And the price will kind of go up and down. So in this case, we're expecting somewhere between 350 and 400. I wouldn't be surprised if it's much higher than that, but we'll see that price kind of change. And they'll, and they're kind of like testing different price points until they get a perfect balance of buyers and sellers. And at that moment, it just goes live. So if you're wanting to buy in on the debut, what you want to do is you want to set a limit order for the amount of shares you want to buy at a price that's just above what you're seeing as the indication price. So if the indication price is 455, you want to set your limit order at least like 458 or 460, especially if you're trying to optimize the number of shares that you're buying with a set num amount of cash. If you have more cash than you want to play with, then you can just set your limit order way above it and just take whatever it gets filled at. But this puts you in a position where you should get filled the second that the stock starts trading, and then you're in a position to play the trade from there. I find that these typically will go live between about 12 and 1.30 p.m. Eastern time, but we've seen these get stretched all the way to 2 or 3 p.m. And you can sit there all day long. This becomes, an, you know, get comfortable, <laughs> uh, turn on some music, try to relax a little bit, uh, and just be, be ready to, um, you know, be ready to adjust your trade until the, it starts going live. And it's a rush. It really is like, if you bet a lot of money on the Super Bowl and the the moment the kickoff starts, you're just you're on the edge of your seat. You're trying to stay focused. You're trying to stick to your game plan. And um, you know, even after playing probably, I don't know, close to a hundred of these IPOs, my heart still gets racing and the adrenaline's pumping. And uh, that's one of the reasons I'm I'm looking forward to this week. So we have a couple others: um, Alchemy Technology. A fairly low share. It's a, as I mentioned, it's a software as a service cloud software for community banks and credit unions, allowing them to kind of compete with bigger banks. Pretty low float of six million shares, but it's the same day as Coinbase, and there's even some other interesting ones that are available on this day. So I'm not sure how much attention this will get from the market. Not super exciting, but be aware of it. Uh, this one is interesting. The next day, this is Carrot Packaging (KRT). And they've got environmentally sound packaging and disposable products, which is a little bit like Danimer, which has done really well over the last several months. Um, everyone's going towards green, renewables, recyclables, and this is sort of in that vein. And they have a lot of established customers. They do kind of the forks and the knives and the plasticware and the you know wrapping for Applebee's, In-N-Out Burger, Jack in the Box, Chipotle, TGI Fridays, yeah. a few others. And the float is just 3.95 million shares. So there is kind of the, you know, the powder keg is set, you know, the match is in hand. And if this catches any kind of fire, it could get very explosive. So I'll probably play this one and just 
kind of see what it does. I uh, don't see a huge downside and potentially, you know, this, this is one of those stocks that really could go nuts. So keep an eye on it. Too simple. This is the kind of leading autonomous semi-truck uh, developer. They're pretty much leading the technology in this field. They're getting a lot of interest and, you know, from big trucking companies, logistics companies. And this is the kind of thing where about six months ago, especially during all the EV hype and craze, you would have expect this to just be a rip, you know, a rip off the start. Things have gotten a little cooler in the EV space recently. Everyone, you know, who's not Tesla has seen a little bit of a pullback. So you want to be a little bit tentative with this. Um, but it is an interesting name, and I will definitely keep an eye on this, given that it's the same date as uh, Carrot. I think that one has more potential to really explode. So you know, I, I probably play that and, and, and keep an eye on Too Simple. May, may not play it, but take notes. But it is interesting, and it's an interesting company and uh, worth noting for the calendar. Um, another one is App Lovin'. This is a, another one that is in what has been a pretty hot space. Anything related to mobile and everything, especially related to advertising, this is kind of the best of both worlds. Uh, it does have a rather high IPO price in the range of 75 to 85. So a lot of people might just be turned off by the high price and the fact that it's not um, it's not super well known. And the app is uh, the the float is fairly standard 25 million i'd say a little bit on the on the shy side of of things but not n nothing like a low float play that would make me go oh yeah this will blow up so yeah. keep an eye on it agilon health this one i don't know much about the <clears throat> even reading up on it it's everything says the same thing it's a platform physicians to directly serve senior patients okay well they're raising a ton of money 1.23 billion dollars so it's a telemedicine type play is what it sounds like something like a, yeah something like telemedicine okay. uh, it also sounds like it's something that is a little bit disruptive in terms of rather than trying to maximize money the, the amount of money that a health plan makes across a bulk like a large number of customers that it's really focused on trying to directly serve each patient in a more customized manner. It's not very well explained and I haven't used the platform, um, but I don't think it's gonna get a ton of retail interest, partly because it's a little confusing, it's not all that sexy, but it is, you know, it is growing fast, 53% growth in 2020. They clearly have, you know, are, are raising a lot of money and it's in the kind of industry that is booming, you know, health services for seniors yeah. is one of those things people say oh it's it's almost like you know it's the kind of thing i would think maybe warren buffett or somebody who's like oh well this sounds like a good i mean uh, it's, it's a demographics play right there's a lot of yeah. boomers out there and they're all getting older so for a long-term play you know maybe keep an eye on this stock and see what it does uh if you want you know if, if you're trying to do sound investing i'm certainly much more in the you know scalp and swing trade on these ipos but I do, one of the reasons I do like playing IPOs is you're really, it's kind of like getting to know a company from the day it's born. And you can see, you know, the IPO price definitely acts as a sort of indicator. Uh, you'll see if a stock does go up, it'll often bounce off that opening price or that IPO price. And you get to track things like the expiration of the silent period, the expiration of the lockup period. And you sort of understand, looking back on a stock, you start, realizing that the, the big swings, the big changes, you're like, oh yeah, no, I remember that. I remember that stock debuted and then it had that earnings report and then the lockup period. And so you kind of, it helps you establish not only what the range is that you can all of course look back on the stock chart and see, but also you have sort of events that you, you know, that you associate with. You don't have to go combing back through the news to understand, hey, well, how come on April 12th that, you know, jumped or, you know, went down? You, you sort of have a, a mental log of, the lifetime of that stock when you follow it from the IPO. And having done this now for just over a year, you know, I remember almost every stock that I've played, you know, when it has a, a big move, I'm like, oh yeah, no, I remember when that IPO and it went up there. So you do sort of build a mental inventory and almost a personal, I can't say relationship, but understanding of the movement of a stock 
from the day it was born when you play these IPOs. All right. Uh, you can find more of Matt's analysis, as, as he said at his site, is ipowarriors.com. Matt, uh, this is a big week. I look forward to hearing how you played Coinbase on Wednesday and uh, what came of that. And uh, we'll talk to you again next Monday and, uh, and see how it went for you. Thanks, Spencer. Have a good All week. Right. Have a trade. Week. All right. Thanks a lot, Matt. Uh, that was Matt Hammond again from IPO Warriors. All right. Uh, just real quick, I want to bring up a graphic of today's – Where's my? why is the banner still up there? Let's bring up a graphic of today's schedule, programming schedule for the day. Pre-market prep is over. Get technical started. We've got Benzinga Pro at 10.30. Specs attack at 11. Power Hour with Luke and Jason at noon. Wall Street Trading Academy with David Green at 2. We've got the At The Close Show. Um, actually, this is this is missing. So that's all right. We're uh, we at, at the close show at three thirty. We've got a new show, the short report with Edwin Dorsey at four o'clock. Cannabis Insider at four thirty. See, we're going late tonight, guys. We're going all the way to like nine p.m. Ryan Rose Beyond is at five. Cheds is at seven, and Ruel, uh, the real report is on at eight. So we got a big day today on Benzinga's YouTube channel. Guys, please, please, please smash that like button for us. Hit subscribe. Leave us a comment. Do all those things that help us with the engagement on YouTube. We appreciate that. I want to thank both our guests today, both Matt Hammond and Tim Quast. Please remember that Tim Quast, I'm sorry, today's show is sponsored by Market Structure Edge, which Tim Quast is the founder and CEO of. Check out the link. It's up on the screen right now, marketstructureedge.com. To learn more, please remember all the information from our show is meant to be used as informational purposes, not for investing or trading advice. If you missed the Benzinga Boot Camp on Saturday, that's okay. You can still rewatch it. There's the link. I'll put the link up in the chat, actually, so you all can see. because. Does nothing for you just seeing it on the screen there. I just put the link in chat. Let me write re watch Benzinga boot camp. There it is. The link um, to to buy the library or the recording of the boot camp from Saturday. Nick Shaheen, Luke Jacoby, Neil Hamilton, Gianni Depochi, Matt Maley, Sylvia Bellrock. Brad Weber, who hosts our show on Thursdays, Peter Tuckman, David Green, who'll be on at 2 o'clock today. It was a great day. I was able to catch a few minutes of it. There is the link up to uh, purchase the replay of the Benzinga Boot Camp. Um, what are other housekeeping that I want to get to today? There is a few other things. Oh, right. We are coming up into our next Benzinga event. Not this week. It is next week. Next Thursday, the 22nd, is our Clean Tech Small Cap Conference. And I do have a quick trailer to play for that. BZSmallCap.com is the link for that. That's going to be a wrap for me. We are at the open. Three, two, one. We're open. Ladies and gentlemen, hope you all had a good pre-market session. Hope you had a great weekend. I'll be back with you throughout the day. This stream is going to end. It'll be redirect you automatically to get technical with Neil Hamilton starting right now.